started, we're, we're really grateful to have uh, Dan Gage, president of NGD America, joining us today to talk about some of the developments in, uh, in transportation, alternative fuel transportation. Dan, thank you for joining us today. Uh, rather than spend uh, any time on his bio, I'll, I think you've all read that in your registration form, uh, but let me move forward really quickly to how we operate. Uh, many of you are, are uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, are repeat offenders for our monthly webinar series, so you know how we work. Uh, your microphones will be muted. Please keep them muted so we can minimize background noise and ask your questions in the chat box. We are recording uh, the meeting and and uh, that will be posted to our YouTube channel uh, sometime later this afternoon. Uh, in addition, with uh, with Dan's permission, we'll share his deck. I think that's okay to do, Dan, thanks. Absolutely. Uh, at your request. So uh, we'll send a link out for that and a link to the YouTube channel uh, video so you can uh, uh, spread the word and, and get this around uh, to others in your company that may have an interest in, in Dan's content. And then one last thing before I turn things over to Dan, um, our future webinar, the next one is August 17th, uh, and it's featuring Jim Keebler, who's the executive director of One Future, uh, which is a methane reduction, industry methane reduction initiative. Uh, and he'll talk about uh, uh, some of the progress that our industry has made in reducing methane emissions and and uh, also about what One Future is all about. So with that, Dan, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let you take it over. And uh, and we will go from there. Great, hopefully you see that. Let me get it in the slide. We sure do. Okay. Yep. Uh, there we do, slideshow. Are we doing slideshow from beginning? There we go, hopefully you all can see that. Working on it, yes, great. Yes, sir, we see it. Okay, super, thank you, Dan. Uh, thanks to you and your team and uh, always a pleasure to work with you and Alex, Judy and the entire team, Natasha. Uh, you know, NGV America, for those who aren't aware, we were started about 35 years ago as an offshoot of the American Gas Association's Technology Committee. We are a separate 501c6 based here in, in DC and we represent basically the entire value chain of natural gas vehicle industry. So uh, everything from LDCs to fleets to OEMs, organizations, uh, fuelers, um, suppliers, networkers, uh, the whole value chain. And we have roughly about 200 members. As I said, we've been in existence for about 35 years. We've seen the ups, we've seen the downs, and uh, we definitely think we're on an upswing now. Um, I will apologize. I'm a, a New Yorker, a New York native, so I talk a little fast and uh, probably throwing a lot of information at you. I'm a visual learner. So as Dan said, I'll provide this slide deck and some of the slides have a little bit of detail in them. And uh, I know sometimes it's nice to go back and sort of study them after you hear something. I'll make this all available, as you, even though I may go through these a little quickly, but I do so apologize Dan, in advance. Yeah. So Dan, I'll just interrupt really quickly. Just a reminder, the chat functions there. If, uh, if, if Dan says something that begs a question or you you want a little more clarification, just enter your question there and I'll interrupt Dan uh, when he takes a breath. And uh, we'll ask the question right Perfect. away. So I'll be monitoring that uh, for you, Dan. There you go. I appreciate that. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, you know, at NGV America here in DC, we believe that climate change is real. I mean, all of us this year, the wacky weather we're having and wildfires and sea temperatures, uh, we know something's happening. And we know that the transportation sector can be cleaner, decarbonized, uh, based on this change, right? This, this high temperatures this summer, we know time is of the essence and that early reductions matter because those results, those achievements, those, that progress you make early on compounds year after year. And as part of that, we think that renewable natural gas vehicles are affordable. We know they're affordable, we know they're scalable and deployable, well, but it's an immediate solution. So that's what we share with policymakers here. And, you know, the other aspect that we'll, we'll fight very hard, both in Washington and the states, is to have policymakers understand that transportation, every solution needs, has a footprint, and that we can't just look at a tailpipe, right? We've got to look at all the complete life cycle, so all three steps, right? The extraction, the production of that source material or the fuel and the equipment that's required to do it, how the energy is generated and those emissions, and then 
when the product's all done being used, what happens to it? Where does it go? It's more than just the tailpipe. Uh, I want to give you just a level set on the state of freight as we see it here, as, uh, so you can understand sort of the challenge that, that we have as a nation and a society before us. Uh, think about everything that we eat, wear, and use. It is a growing goods movement. Port volumes continue to rise. E-retail has just changed the entire scope of how we buy things and get things and procure things and even daily how we eat, right? Uh, we have our food, our groceries delivered. Um, we don't run down to the drugstore anymore. With Amazon, they can be there in three hours. So this is rising demand for same day delivery and all of that adds more and more trucks to the roadways. At the same time, the trucks that are on a roadways continue to age. And I know this number, this chart looks a little outdated, but it's really the most up-to-date that you have from IHS market. Uh, but these are the two over here on the right side, uh, key items to look at. So, hey Dan, um, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm interrupting. Uh, we are not seeing your slides advance. And I'm wondering, do you have it in presentation mode, first of all? I, I do. What do you see right now? Just um, your title slide is all that I've got up on my screen. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let me end this slideshow. Yeah, try again. Are you seeing, what slide do you see now, Dan? Uh, every transportation solution leaves okay. an environmental footprint. So is that readable if I leave it in this mode? Yes. Okay, so let's do that. Um, and I was on this one talking about a growing okay. goods movement. And then here we are, you can see that with the age yeah. of fleets. Okay. Yep, we got it. We're Sorry about it. that. You're going to see my slides on the left here, but um, at the very least, hopefully you can see that and they'll advance. Um, okay, so if you look here in the upper uh, about 11 o'clock on, on this pie chart, you'll see that uh, the average age of a class eight truck on America's roadways is uh, almost 13 years old. It's up from 11 years, just uh, back 10 years prior. Uh, same with a uh, class six truck. So those white box trucks we see on the road that deliver furniture, or more in-town travel, in-town deliveries. The average age, they went up another year. The average age of that white box truck that you're seeing on the highway today is over 16 years old. So trucks are aging uh, all different types of, uh, of, of emissions that are involved with that, right? Different levels of emissions. Um, these charts I just updated, and it just shows that this isn't going to change anytime soon. Uh, as trucks age, the amount of freight on our roadways continues to increase. Uh, and the chart on the left shows you about a 1.4% increase they're estimating annually uh, over the next 25 years, right? So we'll be up to almost 30,000 uh, 30, million tons of freight that gets moved around the United States uh, in 2050. On the far right, what's most interesting is how far does that freight move by, by you know, distance by weight? And you can see that almost three quarters of all freight in the United States moves less than 250 miles. And almost 37% of that of, of total freight is moving less than 100 miles. So this last mile delivery or this, 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 this the Amazon and the UPS uh, uh, e-retail movement has really impacted shipping and freighting. And if you look at how uh, freight is moved you know, across the U.S. This chart's a little, a little dated, but it is as, 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 um, as timely as they have. You can see that so much of that freight is moving on interstate highways. Those are the red lines that you see. Green is rail and blue is uh, inland waterways. So what's the challenge then? All of these trucks, more and more trucks, more and more freight, aging fleets uh, have two big things, right? Criteria pollutants we talk about, so that's the clean air component. And then certainly greenhouse gas emissions, the climate change component, all of you are dealing with those in, in your own organizations. On the clean air front, why is that important? Well, the American Lung Association does a report every year, State of the Air. Uh, its last report was out in April. It shows that one out of every three Americans uh, woke up this morning in a neighborhood with unhealthy air. And if you're a person of color, you're 3.7 times more likely to live in a county that has failing grades across all three criteria. And that's important because of asthma and lung cancer, heart disease, premature death. We saw what happens right during the pandemic when all of this freight traffic diminished, uh, all of a sudden our air quality improved dramatically. Well, we can still do that. We just have to get these dirty trucks off the road. 
Uh, when we look at greenhouse gas emissions, and these numbers are also from the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation or EPA, off of their Office of Transportation and Air Quality, you can see that of all greenhouse gases in the United States, about 29% comes from transportation. Um, light duties make up more than half of that, but the next biggest chunk are medium and heavy duty trucks, about 23%. So, uh, you know, a really, a really a key area that we need to focus on. And the important thing is, if you were listening and watching headlines today, you'd think this is all easy. Well, we've got all these electrified or hydrogen options that are available today. Well, it's not quite so easy. Um, there's a lot that goes into uh, not just developing and, and, uh, and producing a truck, but making it meet all those needs, right? So how do we get to zero as soon as possible? How do we uh, eliminate criteria pollutants? How do we re greatly reduce and decarbonize uh, our greenhouse gas emissions? Um, light duty is one challenge. Heavy duty is a completely different matter because you're talking about huge payloads, 80,000 pound weight limits um, with extended range needs, torque and power. Obviously in the West Coast, you've got grades. Um, fleets need reliability, predictability, consistency. They need a fuel source that's accessible, affordable, resilient. It doesn't go down when the lights go out. Um, they need to be able to keep trucks running. So we think natural gas uh, vehicles are the prime opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for us for five main reasons. And I'll go through those very quickly. But vehicles, cost, we have an emissions profile uh, that beats no other, uh, infrastructure, and then compliance. So when we think of vehicles, and I know we hear from CARB and other groups that there are 100 different models available. When we think of vehicles today that are on the road, deployable and affordable and scalable, Natural gas meets every single criteria, every single sector, marine rail, light duty, medium duty, heavy duty, vocational uh, bus, you know, school bus, transit bus, uh, all across the board. One of the most exciting things to sort of uh, think about here in the next coming year is that this suite of natural gas engines is expanding. Cummins is due out with its 15 liter natural gas. It will actually be eventually a fuel agnostic ICE, so it will eventually run on hydrogen as well but they have a 6.7, a nine and a 12 liter engine today. That 15 liter is currently in trials uh, with fleets across the US right now. And they are all certified. They're certified near zero at a 0.02 gram per brake horsepower per hour NOx, which is virtually um, zero emission. Cummins isn't the only product uh, out there. Um, we've got all sorts of different uh, uh, manufacturers that are doing some really interesting things like Hylian. It has a hybrid truck, it's in essence, an electric powertrain uh, with battery, with you know battery generated, uh, but that battery is charged by an on-road, on-vehicle uh, natural gas engine. So you have the natural gas fuel tanks that have the gen set that battery the pad, uh, power the battery electric. And when you're in, for instance, a campus setting where it has to be 100% electric um, with no no emission at all, you can run off the battery. And then once you get outside that zone, a center city, a port, and you need to go say uh, 100 miles to warehousing, you can then, uh, the vehicle can then switch over and run that natural gas generator, repower and recharge the, uh, the batteries. Hey, Dan, I have, a, I have a question for you back sure. on your uh, Cummins engine slide. Uh, zero, uh, 0 0.02 grams uh, per braking horsepower per hour. Um, yeah. Is that constant from zero to 60 or whatever? And how does that differ from how a diesel engine, a clean diesel engine operates? Yeah, so they have to be certified at that. And there, I have a slide later on talking about the clean trucks program, all of the different components that go into that. But all Cummins uh, natural gas engines are certified both by the EPA and CARB at 0 0.02. The current standard right now, Dan, is, is two. So um, we're 90% cleaner than cleanest diesel, 90% cleaner than the current standard. The, the, there's a new standard that goes into effect in 2027. We already super, surpassed that new standard. Um, it's a certified standard. There have been studies. Uh, you see Riverside has done a, a well-known study on what the vehicle, what that, what that engine actually does in real use situations. And has found that it's actually coming in about 0.01. So it's even cleaner than certified. There've also been you know, a, a host of studies. I've got a lot of data that I could share with someone if they were interested in it that shows how diesel matches, right? Like 
the problem with diesel is not necessarily on highway use, it is idling. And um, the beautiful part about the Cummins engine that even at a low idle, it's still meeting these really stringent air quality standards. Um, affordable and low cost, so that's also key to this, right? Is, is uh, we have the vehicles, but we can, we can bring these vehicles and fleets can deploy them uh, in their own business model that meets their checkbook or pocketbook. And th this slide is a little, is, is, uh, is one that we use talking about the cost effectiveness of our clean air component, right? So when you were looking at say the VW money as it came out or, or uh, the clean school bus money, you get for the technology cost, you get, you get more impact buying natural gas than you would just buying new diesel, or certainly if you would just buying uh, electric. Um, the other thing to think about when it comes to cost, and one of the challenges that the electric components have is really the cost of the battery technology. Again, this is one of those slides that's detailed and I'll have it in, in the takeaways, but you can see here in the battery charge, most batteries uh, that are coming out, whether it's the Tesla super truck or the eCascadia, they tend to run in this 150 to maybe 200 mile range. Again, it's very difficult to say what that range will be because of you know, what you're carrying, what you're hauling, what your grade is, what your duty cycle really is. But the cost of that product right, is really about the battery pack alone is costing about $50,000. Uh, that's an enormous, you know, cost and recognize that uh, we don't know how long that battery pack is going to last. And so when that investment is going to need to be in, is it a five-year uh, uh, overhaul? Is it six years out? Um, but certainly before the life of the vehicle is over for a lot of these, these fleets, like a UPS or a waste management that really runs the ground for a full 12 or 14-year life cycle, um, you will have to change that battery pack. Most of what we're seeing in the long, longer ranges are just these exorbitant costs. And until they can get that into this technology range, they can get a, a range of about five or 600 and have the battery cost down to 37 or $50,000. That's really the sweet spot that they need to get to. So when you look at investment, if you had say a $25 million investment as a fleet, you can get more cleaner trucks with renewable natural gas. So this was just a sample that we did on class eight. You know, if you had $25 million, you could buy about 86 electric trucks, you could get almost 200 renewable natural gas trucks. And when you look at what that number of trucks does across the well to wheel uh, lifetime, or, um, uh, lifetime emissions reduction, you, we went on greenhouse gases and NOxes, uh, uh, particulate matter and VOCs. Why is that sort of, what is the other benefit in terms of cost separate from the vehicle? Well, it's really the cost of the fuel, right? And um, we're seeing now with electric, you know, uh, different charges, battery charges, pass charges, uh, time charges that that add to that add to that uh, recharge cost at the end of the day. And I, I go back to this slide because when we're trying to talk to fleets, and it's 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 really difficult to make an apples apples comparison uh, because there's so many different there's so many different factors that 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 impact what your fuel costs are over your year, but I say, look at what the cost of a gallon of oil or a barrel of oil is today, right? Brent crude uh, it ended on Tuesday about $79 uh, a barrel. Um, at the same time, Henry Hub had a natural gas, so at, at, at 252. So you need 5.8 million BTUs to reach the energy equivalent of one barrel of oil. And you can just see, comparison to diesel, how much savings you can get switching to natural gas, just based on you know an energy equivalent basis. And, we have a lot of data that demonstrates what that looks like. The chart here on the right shows uh, from April, you know, what CNG uh, per gallon, uh, gasoline gallon equivalent and diesel gallon equivalent is running compared to gas and diesel um, propane on some of the other options. And, um, you know, it consistently is the lowest cost alternative fuel available. And over time, the beauty of that too is natural gas prices, that's the green line on this chart, natural gas prices stay relatively stable. So as oil goes up and down, you know, it's much easier to plan a uh, long-term. Um, that trend's gonna continue. Uh, this is from US uh, Department of Energy here. Uh, it shows over time, natural gas prices will continue to stabilize or even fall. Uh, motor fuel prices for gas and diesel go up. And the, this, this sort of grid on the right shows you why it's because you know, natural gas, uh, only about 25% of the, of the commodity is the commodity cost at dispensing. 
whereas diesel, you know, the, the fluctuation in market has a big impact on that. So with natural gas, you're, you're certainly saving cost on the product up front, the vehicle up front, the unit up front, but also on fuel over time. Um, we also yeah, have- let, let, me, let me just interrupt really quickly perfect. and just remind folks, uh, as we have a little break here, uh, do think about questions that you may want to ask Dan and enter them into the chat. So uh, Dan, maybe as you as you slide through this, uh, just, just you might encourage that, but uh, great job so far. Lots of really great information in here. So thank you. Okay, great. Um, our third point is on the emissions profile, right? So Dan made this, uh, asked this question earlier on um, about the uh, certification, right? That Cummins Westport on a, when we're talking about criteria pollutants, um, and in this case, the, the NOx standard, we're at a 0.02, 90% uh, cleaner than EPA's current standard, 90% cleaner than diesel. And we surpassed that clean trucks rule that's effective in 2027, the new rule that just came out. And, and so from, we, we have a great message when it comes to clean air. But more importantly, we have a great message when it comes to carbon and uh, greenhouse gas, because that's what so many folks are focused on now. And I know for you all, this is very elementary, but we, I use this chart when we're talking to legislators just to understand you know, what methane is, what, what natural gas is. It's just right, four parts hydrogen, one carbon. It's an ultra clean fuel. If you were using it like gasoline in your car, it's the equivalent of 130 octane. And so when we look at it, when it comes to gasoline or diesel, which are complex hydrocarbons, right? Um, we're ultra low carbon just to begin with. We have one carbon atom compared to eight with gas and 16 with diesel. So right off the bat, even if you're using conventional natural gas, oops, you, have a, you have a huge savings. And that's important because if we look at this other chart from, uh, from the US to, uh, EPA, you'll see that the greenhouse gas emissions Yes, nitrous oxides, yes, methane, yes, hydrofluor uh, hydrofluorocarbons are all important. But the big issue that we have that dealing with with GHG has to do with CO2. Um, as again, when you are using conventional, it's a big increase and big improvement over diesel, about 11% if it's LNG, 17% if you're running conventional CNG. But more importantly, the big news in our industry, and, and I know what a lot of utilities are doing, is looking at renewable natural gas and recoverable methane. And I know with this group, I don't need to get into the feedstocks, but it comes from all different forms and fashions. Um, you know, it's just, you've probably seen these charts repeatedly on how it's produced. Uh, you know, multiple uh, feedstocks go through a digester, a landfill waste comes directly into a biogas, right? But you come out, come out of either with a biogas RNG that's scrubbed and cleaned into biomethane and into the pipeline and then used as a vehicle fuel. Um, I think the beautiful part of uh, now Oregon and Washington State have working LCFS programs, but the beautiful part about California's program is that it's measuring all of these pathways. It's measuring all of these production points and they go, come into the California system for use as a motor vehicle fuel. And you can see when, when all of those points for all these different options are, 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 uh, are factored or, or measured, you can see right here where bio CNG um, ranks. So those pathways go anywhere from just under 100 um, to all the way down to negative 600. Uh, bio CN LNG, because of the production and the, and the factory you need to make to get it to temperatures, it has a little bit more, uh, a little bit more carbon intensive, but electricity, uh, you can see here electricity, um, they do have it in the system going below zero, but that's because that electricity is actually generated by renewable natural gas. Um, the big news in the California LCFS program is that uh, last year's quarter data was negative 119. The fiscal year, the calendar year 2022 ended with a, RNG ended with a negative 98.98, so an, almost a negative 100 carbon intensity. That means that California fleets that fueled with bio CNG, and because 97% of all natural gas motor fuel dispensed at the pump is RNG in California, any California fleet that's running on natural gas, in essence, last year, ran at a carbon negative result, a carbon negative result. And that's the, been the, the, uh, the impact for the last three consecutive years. And you see how natural gas, renewable natural gas or bio CNG, stacks up and they had that really difficult chart to see, but you can see how it stacks up 
against the uh, average scores of electricity and some of the other options. Um, natural gas is not just a renewable natural gas is not just a trend we're seeing in California. It's a trend we're seeing all across the US when it comes to motor fuel. 69% of all natural gas molecules dispensed at the pump in 2022 were from renewable sources. Um, and we've got a lot of data points and uh, research and uh, projects that, are, that we can share with you on that. But the, the takeaway is that uh, the carbon content of natural gas motor fuel continues to decrease because it's being mixed, more and more RNG is, is, is added into the system. Our members have made an industry pledge to be 80% by 2030. Uh, since we were 69% last year, we think we'll meet that by, uh, by 2025, at least five years in advance. Um, and more and more fleets are requesting or requiring RNG in their fueling contracts. Uh, any questions on fueling? I'm happy to take questions through the chat. Uh, please just keep posting. Um, next is infrastructure. I think the big thing for us is, uh, yes, we don't have the number of stations that we want coast to coast, but we had a heck of a better start than where electric is and certainly where hydrogen is. Um, you know, we've got uh, pipeline, 2.5 million uh, miles of pipeline across the U.S. We've got about 1,600 stations from coast to coast. Um, renewable natural gas can be produced in every U.S. state. Uh, job impact and the, the other aspect when we talk to legislators here and especially in Washington is that natural gas pays into the highway trust fund. So we're paying to rebuild all those roads and bridges. Um, you know, it's a it's a domestic fuel. Uh, we can talk a lot about that uh, uh, and some of the anti-China. Uh, sentiment that you see driving a lot of policy here in Washington, not just from the Republican side of the aisle, but also on the uh, on the Democratic side of the aisle. Um, but more importantly, you know, we are a one-to-one -one replacement. We're not a disruptive transition. So when you think of a fleet's infrastructure, they don't have to change their business model to 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 utilize and transition to natural gas. Their routes, their employee skill sets, uh, they all just need to be uh, updated slightly. Uh, and improved upon to, to meet that RNG uh, transition. With natural, with, uh, with electric and hydrogen, um, those business models are really pretty much upset. Uh, I, I don't wanna talk too much about this, but um, I'll, I'll just remind the folks that, you know, uh, natural gas is you know, $2.5 million miles of pipeline, but pipeline that you all are, are supporting and, uh, and the local distribution networks uh, that you all deliver um, you know, those, that, a lot of that fuel makes its way to infrastructure today and to, to uh, stations. Um, it's a, an, an awful lot, the, the electric, uh, electrification sector has an awful lot of work to do uh, to, um, in terms of reliability of the grid, in terms of uh, uh, grid capacity, and in terms of transmission capacity. This just shows, puts it into perspective, you know, how much power you need uh, in this case, on the far right, a 50 Class 8 heavy-duty fleet would need about 9 megawatts of power at its facility just to, to charge those, uh, those vehicles uh, for their duty cycles. That's the energy equivalent of the Empire State Building. So uh, the electric utility uh, industry has an awful lot to, uh, to, to share or to, to improve upon. And um, this will just show you that uh, there's been a lot, and I'm sure you've read a lot lately about what that means. Charging stations... Uh, will soon need about as much power as a stadium. And this this uh, study looked at you know truck stops and, uh, and and highway stops for vehicles, but we're talking about huge amounts of power uh, that need to be upgraded. We're already there. Um, same with capacity, right? Uh, in New York, the ISO found in a study last year that it basically needs to triple the current generation capacity uh, uh, that it has today just to meet the light duty um, transportation uh, uh, goals that it has. And uh, we all know that, that uh, there's an awful lot of folks who are uh, concerned about where components are being, uh, components for batteries being derived from or mined from, as well as uh, you know, new power sources. So if you're gonna put in an, a, a, a wind farm or you're gonna put in a new solar array, uh, that that all needs to get connected to the grid somehow. We're seeing an awful lot of opposition to that. Uh, so that's gonna make it uh, much more harder. It delays those timeframes. Um, again, natural gas is in a good place to already uh, supply, uh, supply that needed fuel. Um, 
The last point I wanna make is just a little bit on compliance. And I know we're facing an awful lot of headwinds there. Um, you know, Happy to address some of these questions. Uh, we just talked, uh, Dan and I, at the start, a little bit about the clean trucks plan and that certification. You know, that uh, standard was, the new standard was certified in December of 2022. Uh, it basically brings that NOx standard down to a 0.035 grams per brake horsepower per hour or 35 milligram per horsepower per hour uh, by, uh, uh, requirement by model year 2027. And at 0.02, we already meet that. So we like to say we're clean truck compliant today. You can see this is the uh, the table that was taken out of that. This is these are the uh, you asked me this, uh, Dan, uh, all the different uh, requirements. But there's a supplemental emission test and the federal test procedure. They have to meet a 35 uh, milligram NOx requirement by 2027, a 60 man, uh, milligram uh, hydrofluorocarbon, a uh, five uh, particulate matter, and a 60, 6.0 uh, CO gram. Um, we are already well below all of those. So uh, natural gas meets those stricter clean air requirements um, uh, in, in terms of federal EPA. Uh, when we also think of some federal rules coming down the pike and we're starting to see some states, including California, talk about this, they're gonna require all organizations, all publicly traded organizations, um, in this case, federally, it's through the Security and Exchange Commission, they're gonna mandate reporting of their scope one and two emissions. So scope one emissions, you know, those deal with your vehicles and your, your consumption there uh, 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 as a company and your facilities. And then scope two adds in even more, another layer of that. Scope three adds basically all of your supply chains and every other aspect of your operation. Um, this is gonna mean that there are a lot of public fleets out there, especially those, the, the larger public fleets um, that are looking uh, how are they going to be able to impact? How are they going to improve on those emissions reporting? It's going to have a big impact on, on, uh, on investment and investment decisions. Uh, we think that that uh, accelerates the use of renewable natural gas um, as a fleet option. Um, California, certainly, as well as some other states that have decided to tap into what California is doing and, and, and sign on, uh, have a very, very aggressive right, a plant, a advanced clean truck which is a sales uh, mandate, um, percentage mandate, and then advanced clean fleet, which means uh, fleets over time are gonna have to increasingly number, uh, increasing number of, of alternative fuels that meet ultra low or even no carbon uh, emission standards. Um, uh, there are, uh, there's a lot to talk about on the policy front about litigation and where that stands and what, you know, there's a, as an attorneys general, 27 attorneys generals that are suing uh, to overturn that. We've got uh, an agreement that EMA just came uh, together called the Clean Truck Partnership with some other, uh, other partners uh, and came up with an agreement with California. But we hear a lot of times, how does ultra low or, or near zero technology meet that uh, advanced clean fleet requirement? And I'll share with you this, uh, if you go to my, our colleagues in California, the California Renewable Transportation Alliance, they have a great website and page right there at ca-rta.org. Um, some great FAQs and some takeaways about how natural gas and specifically renewable natural gas meets those requirements. Um, and just to, just to wrap up, um, we have a great document on our website, Start Now, RNG is How. Um, you can find it just going to ngvamerica.org. There's a flash page that comes up, but we've got a great report that's very fleet focused on what a fleet can do, um, why this is a great opportunity, it's a great time, uh, it's affordable, it's domestic, it's deployable, and it's, uh, it's available today, right? So we can start achieving those results that we need sooner rather than later. And as Dan and I were talking at the outset too, we are dedicating our annual meeting um, this year totally towards a fleet audience to expand and share with fleets just how they can make that transition it will not be a commercial, it will not just be a sales pitch for any one particular product. Uh, the first day will really focus on the technologies that are available. They'll be there in the parking lot for ride and drives, to touch, to kick the tires. Uh, we'll have um, folks all across the spectrum there for prospective fleets to talk to. And then on Tuesday, we'll really go through sort of a fleet academy, talking about ordering and what's available and when it'll be available, what the books look like, uh, what the spec needs to be for based on your application 
what you'll need to think about in terms of team training and fueling, prepping for fueling and prepping for driver training and how do you get your facilities prepared, ready for to be able to service the vehicles. And then we'll talk all about fueling options and, and, and how, you can, how you can get started sooner rather than later. Um, and one of the big challenges I think some of the OEMs have today that are really focusing or have focused a lot of time and attention on electrification is that yes, they're developing product and they still maybe don't have that product where they need it to be when it comes to a price point or on range, but they do have product coming to market. The big challenge these fleets have are, you know, they're placing those orders and then they're finding when they go to the utility that it's going to take three, four, five, even eight years uh, before they'll be able to have access to appropriate power at that facility. We don't have that charge. We don't have that uh, challenge right now. We have ability to get folks up and running uh, very, very quickly once that truck comes in in, um, in, um, in off the assembly line. So um, that's what our show is uh, uh, focused on this year. And we're happy to, um, we're happy to, uh, to uh, encourage you and help, help us uh, get some, uh, some interested fleets to, uh, to show up. Um, yeah, with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Dan, and hopefully we have a few questions. Well, first of all, would you go back to that, uh, the, the conference slide, please? Yes, sir. I just, I just want to encourage uh, everybody on this call to reach out to fleets that you may be aware of um, that, that uh, any really fleet, whether they're actively exploring alternative fuel vehicles or not, um, and let them know about this opportunity. Again, the conference is focused on fleets and fleet operators, owners and operators, and is designed to give them a soup to nuts overview of, of the benefits and uh, really requirements of adopting uh, uh, this kind of alternative fuel vehicle. So I think it's going to be a terrific thing for folks and uh, I encourage you just to encourage your customers, your clients, your contacts to consider going if only to just learn more about yeah. it. I think one yeah. of the biggest things that confronts fleets is is you know you start if you're a fleet, you know you start from the presumption everything's working fine. I don't have a problem, why fix it? Uh, but maybe somebody just wants to learn a little more about what's going on in this world. And I think this is a great opportunity, you know, no commitment required. Uh, uh, just go learn. So I encourage you yeah, all. And to, I'll, I'll say, Dan, this out. document, um, the Start Now effort that we put together last spring, so, you know, well over a year ago now, we had a, an online fleet academy. So if you go to this website here, this page on our website, there is a downloadable, you know, uh, final six, seven panel document that you're able to share. Some of the slides and charts that I had in these slides were, were derived from this uh, this document. But we also have on there our four. We did a we did a, a visual or a, an online a viral fleet academy last year. In essence, this page that you see online or that you would share with a fleet, we're going to have all of those experiences in person. So it was such a great success online. We decided to bring it in-house. And if anyone was at ACT Expo in Anaheim, which really is a really you know, huge national show for all the alternative fuels, fleets of all sizes and shapes uh, show up at that. There was such a huge uh, amount of interest in renewable natural gas and the Walmart truck that they had there, the Walmart 15 liter Cummins uh, engine vehicle, um, that we decided to take that on a smaller scale and just obviously focus on renewable natural gas trucks and products. And uh, we're doing that, like, uh, like Dan said here in, uh, in San Diego. Yeah. Plus San Diego is a nice place to go. Uh, 